Welcome to Vanadium. Today on Vanadium, we're taking a trip to Edgewood. Not a place many have heard of. And this is going to be about the madness of science. Really, the madness of scientists. Because, really, I maybe discovered a little bit of madness in myself during the research for this. Because when I started off doing the research for this video, I had... I was definitely more on one side than the other with respect to the lab and the research that occurred at the Edgewood Chemical and Biological Center in Maryland in the, uh, in the 50s and 60s and also into the, into the 70s. So we had a 20 year long run at the Edgewood Center. And it was a place that invented a lot of things. So one of the things would, was VX gas, sarin gas, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of the incapacitating riot control compounds. And I'm just going to read some of the the research that they focused on over the years. So 30% of their research was incapacitating compounds. Lethal compounds was about 15%. Riot control compounds is 14%. Protective equipment and clothing. Well, I see they're trying to help people there. That was 13%. Development, evaluation, and test procedures. Got to do that. That's 12%. Effects of drugs and environmental stress on human psychological mechanisms. 6.4%. Human factor tests, ability to follow instructions. <laughs> I'm going to spend 2% of their time on that. But then there's a, a category, other, which at a place like that, I really wonder what kind of interesting things the other category encompasses. And the lab, they invented uh, sarin gas, VX, and I can just talk about it. I can, there's a whole list of things I'll go over. So they did, they did research with a lot of the anticholinesterase nerve agents, VX sarin, a lot of organophosphorus poisons, uh, carbamate pesticides, mustard nerve agents. Also, a lot of the antidotes for these things were developed in the same laboratory, side by side. Some other things that they experimented with were uh, LSD, PCP, cannabinoids, BZ, which is, is very scary. That's the Jacob's Ladder drug. That's uh, definitely had never got popular in the, uh, in the underground world. Riot control agents, alcohol and caffeine. And they also had a weaponized THC, which uh, they called red oil. So they, de they developed a lot of very interesting things in that run. And actually, if you look at it, if you look at the list, they were open for a while. But that's a very productive laboratory. And it makes sense when you start to learn about some of the people involved. Now, these things that they're inventing there are horrifying. Granted. And that's what I really came in to this, to this research, is talking about the... Basically, they had a little tank they would keep people in, a nine by nine foot room, and they would put soldiers in there and experiment basically with chemical weapons and antidotes. And the soldiers were all volunteers. So you could argue about how much a soldier is really volunteering and how much knowledge they had ahead of time. But there are actually some people who worked at the lab that still defend it. They're still staunch defenders of their work today. So that's, there weren't people who tried to slink away after it was over. They were very proud of their work which says something. You know, there's some very unfair contrast to this lab, and very unfair comparisons, rather, to this lab and MK Ultra. The two, two things were completely unrelated. Those were unwitting, unwitting, not volunteers. These were just citizens. So this is, something, this is something a bit different, and the people all knew they were going to go through some sort of you know, procedure that involved chemical testing. Now, one of the not so nice parts of what they did is they had this, like I mentioned before, a nine foot by nine foot room, and they would put seven people in there. So right, right away, I ain't volunteering past that. That's, I, I don't have the right stuff, if, if that's what it takes, to go in a room, seven, that's, that's a tight room. And so they would tell the people, we're going to test gas masks, and we're going to fill the room with gas, so put on your gas mask when we tell you, and you protect yourself. Okay? They did do that test. And they were tested gas masks, and they developed a lot of really great technology. A lot of it's implemented in uh, gas masks and respirators today. Now, but the funny part, they had some real pranksters at this place. They, in many of the cases, the room was not actually gassed at all, and the gas was delivered from the gas masks that the volunteers were given, not to their knowledge. So while they thought they were protecting themselves, they were actually giving themselves a controlled dose of toxin. So that was one way that a more carefully designed test. So that was attractive and also it was a surprise so that people didn't know they were being dosed with something. They thought they were being protected. So that gives you another kind of angle for the experiment. I can see the practicality of it, but it's horrifying. And this entire lab run 
one of the things that's really interesting is there were really just a handful of people that kind of ran the place the entire 20 year run. And this guy who ran the lab, who's their chief scientist, studying him is what made me kind of change my, my feeling about the laboratory and its mission. And it shows how the ideas and the leadership of one person can really kind of, you know, take kind of an overall horrifying mission and kind of turn it kind of good because this guy was a cowboy. And I have to admit, after learning a lot about him, Van Murray Sim, who's sometimes called the Mengele of Edgewood, that's ridiculous. Chief scientist of Edgewood, Van Murray Sim, is becoming one of my heroes. And uh, one of his quotes that I'll just give you, it's a very short quote that he was given at, uh, I don't know, it was around 9.30 in the morning to his colleagues at work when he was in the middle of a psychotic break from a chemical weapon, a psychological, basically a psychochemical, a neurochemical weapon, like a incapacitating, like LSD type agent, that he was, I'm battling with the compound. So this is, that was part of his work, so he clocked in that day and did battle with the compound for, from what I understand, could be 72 hours in the case of some of these drugs, such as BZ, the horrible Jacob's Ladder drug that, uh, that the CIA actually dosed on a bunch of French citizens. I'll talk about that on another podcast one day. Van Murray Sim, the chief scientist of the laboratory, the Mengele of Edgewood. Now, this man did not experiment on children the way Dr. Mengele did. And this, that's why this comparison is ridiculous. What this man did do is experiment a hell of a lot on himself, more than anybody else. And actually, he tried to take the direction of the lab from experimentation on, you know, humans and animals. They talk bad things with animals. No excuse for that. But he tried to move away from that and instead experiment on himself. And when he experimented on himself, he did, tried lots of different things. But this man was not, he wasn't beating around the bush. He, was a, he actually tried VX and sarin on himself. He dosed himself. So I actually, I have some, some of the laboratory notes. So v, I'll just talk a little bit about VX. This is, he was one of the, the, the chief developers of this compound. What VX, you might remember it from The Rock with Nick Cage and Sean Connery with the little beads, with the green beads. That's not how it's delivered. I'm pretty sure. I don't, I don't know that much about it, about the actual delivery system. The chemical itself is actually a pretty simple chemical compound. It's, a, uh, it's an oily kind of thing. It's similar to sarin, ga sarin ga gas, they call it, but really it's more of an, an oil at, uh, at room temperature, and it slowly volatilizes. But sarin gas was actually um, responsible for the Tokyo, not responsible for the cult that attacked the people, used sarin in a subway attack in the 90s. And it, thankfully, they weren't as great a chemist these cult members, and they didn't synthesize the, the, do the chemistry exactly right. And also sarin has some problems in its delivery. VX is actually way more dangerous, and that's the compound that uh, Van Murray Sim is playing with in his lab. And it stands for uh, Venomous Agent X. So they had a bunch of other VA type drugs, but VX, Venomous Agent X, was really the, the, the grand poobah. And it's an organophosphate, kind of thing. And actually, if you, look at, if you look at the chemical structure, it looks like a lot of other things. A lot of, uh, a lot of pharma simple pharmaceuticals have a similar kind of structure. You can see the sulfur, you can see the phosphorus bond. Phosphorus in uh, chemicals, especially organic com uh, chemicals, can sometimes mean a great deal of trouble. A lot of complex chemistry. It's responsible for a lot of our biology. But it's extremely, these kind of toxins go into um, actually nerve sites, into uh, cell receptor sites, nerve receptor sites, and they can disrupt a chemical called acetylcholine, and that's a neurotransmitter, and that affects all your muscle movements, your thinking, everything. It's one of the most, it's even, in a way, more fundamental to your, uh, your neural chemistry than serotonin is. Serotonin is maybe like a sibling to acetylcholine, and that's what venomous agent X, that's the system that it acts on. So this is nasty shit. And you can just, The Rock, the way that, how carefully Nick Cage, who's an expert, the way he kind of deals with this shit, and how much respect he gives this chemical, I think it's a convincing performance that I actually believe Nick Cage was, was a chemist. And because he was scared when he was handling those beads, pretty as they were. 
So Van Murray Sim is playing with this compound in his lab. And his mission, as stated, is to make war more humane. And his idea was kind of a response to what he saw in the horrors of World War I, which used, I mean, very simple, horrible chemicals. You know, hydrochloric acid, you attack people with chlorine gas, things like that. And it killed more of your own side and shifted with the wind, so it wasn't very effective. So they wanted something that wasn't going to be quite as horrifying. And also, Van Murray Sim really tried to develop a lot of the countermeasures and a lot of the cures and preventative measures for these things at the same time, with actually probably equal, if not more effort, in terms of manpower and resources at the laboratory. So that says quite a lot. And he could have done whatever he wanted. Because this guy was taking these drugs. I mean, not only are they they're chemical weapons in high enough doses, and by high enough milligrams, you know, one milligram of this stuff will do you in. But he's experimenting with, you know, smaller threshold doses and micrograms and just having a ball at work. Actually, not really having a ball. I'm going to quote from, uh, this is, I'll give you the website here for the Vanadium audience. But um, two hours after the injection of 0.225 milligrams per kilogram, actually, no, that's, that is almost a lethal dose. <laughs> that's a lot. Dr. Sim, the chief scientist of the lab, was given slow, continuous infusion of VX at a rate of one microgram per minute until the cholinesterase levels definitely fell below 50% of normal function. The inf that's not good. The infusion, this is the chief chemist of the lab at work. The infusion was continued until the red blood cell and whole blood cholinesterase levels had dropped to approximately 15% of normal. 15% of normal. This is like a primary metabolic system. The graphic representation in the course of events is given. That's not all that important. The <laughs> So airway resistance measurements do not seem to change appreciably. The pupils dilated for approximately one to two hours from two to, th two to three millimeters at the peak of the agent. So I'm going to go on here. This is where it gets a little worse. This is where the trip gets bad. This is the uh, chief scientist of the lab, the head of the lab. His subordinates are taking notes. He's at work. And they're describing what's happening to him. At one point, Approximately three and a half hours after the onset of the continuous infusion, the subject became pale, stopped talking, and appeared out of contact with the responsible medical officer, his subordinate, Dr. Kimura. At this point, the decision was made to discontinue the infusion of VX. A few minutes after the subject announced that he felt spinny and started to salivate and was not able to keep air from leaking out of his mouth while having his volume measurements taken. Vomiting started at this point. Approximately 20 mission, minutes after infusion was terminated, the subject became irrational and started to thrash around and wanted to have the various venous indwelling catheters removed. The confusional and irrational period lasted about 15 minutes. One of the venous indwelling catheters was kept in place in the event the subject required resuscitation measures as, as such a intravenous atropine. This man is at work. He's in charge. And this is what he's doing to himself. And not, not in the dead of night. Not like a flatliners type thing where the medical students are breaking through the other side. In the dead of night when no one's watching. He's doing this. Hey, everybody. Everybody have their coffee. Let's get started. And this is why this man, Van Murray Sim, I mean, if we had, ima look at what, imagine that kind of passion in all kinds of different fields. Now, I, I'm, I can only defend their activities so much. But I'm just saying that that kind of dedication to your work, I don't know, I admire it. You know, and he, you know, he did do some things that, uh, you know, some people were critical of. So he loved to, he was, he was a prankster. As a prankster, I don't know if you'd really call this a prank. But he would dose his uh, co-workers with LSD at the lab. He would usually tell them at one point, and it wasn't the type of MK Ultra shit where they were getting people to jump out of windows. Allegedly, I don't know. But he was more playful than that. And I, I don't think anybody really sued him over it. I, I don't know. But I just can't imagine that. But one of his favorite things that he developed in this, he, managed, he, he figured out a way to basically weaponize marijuana. Just in the dosage form. And he made this thing, this a substance called red oil. And it would make people so high that it would incapacitate them. 
Now in California, I bet that recipe would be worth quite a lot of intellectual property these days. So he, his, his main policy with respect to new drugs and compounds, I'm gonna take it myself first. That's the spirit. It, that is insane. And very few people other than him around him probably knew exactly how insane that was. And he continued to do it for almost 20 years and lived and was productive and articulate and actually had, he had people, he was in charge of people. This was your, somebody's boss. I don't know, this guy's kind of amazing. It's hard not to look up to somebody like this. My, his quote, I'm battling with the compound. He was a man of few words. That, that, from, what I, from what I understand. And he had another interesting habit that I also kind of, I don't know what to think about it. I, I have to say I, I kind of like it in a way. He loved to jump out of windows, just in the middle of meetings at the laboratory. The laboratory was only a couple of floors. But he would just jump out of the window just for shits and giggles during the workday. Now, most of the people who have an ADM audience, I think you'll agree with me that we're not, workplaces, we're not, this level of hijinks, Maybe it might happen from time to time, but it's certainly not stained the way that it was at Edgewood. This place was a true, it was a place where the, the madness of science and the madness of scientists could thrive. And it was, when I, f I first learned about this lab, it was somewhat of an inspiration to me, right? Anne Marie's Asylum. But I did a little more research for this video and I, I've even discovered even more fondness for some of these characters involved. And there are some other people. Uh, James Ketchum was part of the team. And there were a host of other people that were brought in in Operation Paperclip. So none of the head people of the lab and a lot of the, these, these names and titles of the people that were brought in under Operation Paperclip are not easy to access. I might do a little more dig and make a part two. But there were some Nazis at the lab. And it's amazing to me that the lab even put in a serious effort to move away from human experimentation and to develop. They were even talking about developing some sort of uh, quantitative measurement tool to look at the toxicity of these things and get away from using animal or human subjects at all, including the head scientist. <laughs> so this place, it was a place of madness, but also sort of a place of wonder because the people involved had passion. And in the list of things they did, they, they definitely weren't perfect. But some of the things they've discovered today, have, I mean, they've, the gas mask technology, a lot of the, the filter technology, all of that stuff was patented right at the lab. You know, a lot of, and other relevant things they made were, uh, in, riot control stuff, tear gases and things like that, which people are enjoying across the United States right now. So they, that, that's fun. But also the protective equipment to protect against that. People are using out in the riots as well. So see how science can be used on both sides here? A good example. Van Murray Sim. A complex man who did a lot of complex work. But in a way, hero. In a way, hero. So that's, uh, in one case, it's an interesting case where you... I've, my mind has been changed in the course of doing research. And I, I love that. I love, I love being kind of torn about things. I love having internal controversy. I've learned to love it. I didn't always love it. But I think if you can learn to live in the space where you're not so sure of everything all the time and you're constantly trying to figure it out, it, it's very stimulating. And I think you're, you'll be more on the right side of things in retrospect. Just my thoughts for the day. Thank you very much. This is Vanadium.